OK, we're going to do a hypothesis test about uh, two samples of apple trees. Some are in the shade, some are, some are in the open. We want to find out whether there's a, a difference in these masses. So um, uh, we have to read the wording of the question carefully. We're going through the normal five steps. Um, but part one actually separates off one of those for us. We've got to do hypotheses. So uh, that's always step one anyway. So uh, it's a uh, normal test. Uh, comparing means. So uh, hi null hypothesis is going to be that the means are the same in both conditions. So I've stated this in context. The mean mass for trees in the shade is the same as the trees in the open. And then um, the alternate hypothesis is going to contradict that, but I have to read the question carefully because are we interested in any difference or are we interested in a particular distance? And the thing I'm investigating is, are the masses, um, on average, smaller than uh, when they're in the shade? So I'm therefore not interested in any old difference. I'm only interested in the difference that the mean mass for trees in the shade is smaller than the other mean. And because I've got this uh, preference, uh, this, this, this insistence that I'm looking for smaller masses, this is a one-tailed test that I'm going to do. Now, that isn't a required part of writing out the hypotheses, but I suggest you always do it um, because it will help when you come to your critical values. OK, so that was part one of this particular question. Now, part two goes off and asks about something else. It says, give the, the relevance of the central limit theorem to this investigation. Now, the central limit theorem allows me to use a normal distribution when the underlying population isn't known to be normal. So looking at the wording of this question, at no point does it tell me that masses of apples are normally distributed. So I need to be using a normal distribution because I'm doing a normal test. So the central limit theorem allows me to use a normal distribution test even though the original populations aren't normal. And the reason why the central limit theorem applies, OK, we have to look at the sample sizes. These have to be at least 30 for the central limit theorem to actually apply. Now, luckily, they are. So the, so the points I have to make in this, I have to say that I can use the central limit theorem because the sample sizes are big enough. And I have to say why I need to use the, normal, the, the central limit theorem. It's because I don't know that the original uh, populations were normal, but I want to use a normal distribution for my test statistic. So here we go. The populations are not known to be normal. That's the first point I need to make. However, the sample sizes are more than 30, so our test statistic will be approximately normal. Or we could say, so we can use a normal distribution uh, for our critical values of the test. OK, so part three asked me to actually do the test. So I've done one stage already. I've done my hypotheses. I've got to do the remaining four stages. So in order, the next one is to calculate the test statistic. Now, the first decision I have to make is exactly where I am uh, in the formula book. Um, I know I haven't got a matched pairs design here. I've got independent samples. Um, I, I know I'm going to be doing a normal test because the question was quite kind and told me that, OK? But in the case of a normal distribution test, um, I can either choose to assume the two standard deviations of the populations are the same, in which case I need to be using this formula and I need to be doing this thing from over here, or I can keep my standard deviation separate, in which case I'm using a formula here with a separate standard deviation for each population. And I think that's the case we've got here. There's nothing in the question. The question is always, wording will always help. Um, we can identify what we've got. So we've got um, two uh, sample st standard deviation, uh, Sx and Sy from the two stand, uh, samples, and we've got an N for the two samples. Have we got anything to tell us to assume that the populations have the same standard deviation? And the answer is no. OK, we are without assuming the standard deviations of the populations are equal. So what I have here, I just said it now, but let's reiterate. I have sample standard deviations. OK, now these are the things that your Casio calculator would actually call sigma x. It's the smaller value. It's not the unbiased estimator of the population. So the first thing I need to do with my sx and sy, OK, and that's the right-hand column on the notes, is the first thing I need to do is this adjustment. So I need to change my um, 
sample standard deviations into estimators of the population. And we have this formula for each one to do with that. So I need to summarize the data from the table. Here it is. I'm going to summarize that and start, apply, start applying these formulas. So here are the numbers that I had. And here's the first formula I need to use to estimate um, a population standard deviation from each of these S's. So there's that formula, so I'm going to apply it first of all for the x's. So I'm going to get an estimated sigma for the x's, okay, and that is going to be n, which is 50, times 7.85 squared, okay, divided by n minus 1, which is 49, and I need to do the square root of all of that. So on the calculator, that's what the calculation looks like. And my calculator is telling me that's 7.9296. So I'm going to round that to 7.93. Uh, what 7.93 will do. And then I have to do the same calculation for the Y population. So here are the numbers in the formula. And then on the calculator, entering that calculation, we get 7.342. So now I've got my two estimated standard deviations set up and I'm ready for the next step. And the next step, here we are, is at the top here. Okay, I need to use this formula. The second one, this one only applies when we are assuming the two standard deviations are the same. We're not, so it's the top one. So I need to do this. Now, this term here, the difference in the two mu's, these are the population means. And for the tests we're doing, the null hypothesis was always going to be that the two means are the same. I've got my hypotheses here. Okay, H0 is going to be the two means, the two population means are the same. So for, because of that, this bit here, the, the assumed difference in the population means is always going to be zero. So I just need to do X bar minus Y bar, take away nothing at all. So just X bar minus Y bar divided by what's on the bottom of the fraction. So here's that formula. We've just agreed that this part of the formula is zero, so I'm going to get rid of it again. So I've got my uh, two sigmas set up before. I've got my two n's on this piece of paper. I need to go back and remember what the two x bars were, okay, or the x bar and the y bar, I should say. So for my x sample, I had a mean of 102.5, so that's my x bar and my so here are my means uh, from the question for the, each sample and substituting to the formula x bar minus y bar is those two values subtracted divided by the square root of sigma x squared. Oh, I could have kept that without the square root. Never mind. 7.93 squared. Okay. Divided by nx, which is the 50. Okay. Plus the 7.342 squared divided by the 40. So I can type all of that into my calculator. So here's what that looks like. Okay, press equals, and I get the magic number, my z value, my test statistic is minus 9.0.929. So here's my test statistic that I've worked so hard for. Okay, it's going to be plain sailing from now. We've now done the test statistic, we've got to do critical value, we've got to do comparison, we've got to do conclusion. So for my critical value, I've got to remember the details. I need a significance level. Okay, so the question uh, gives me a 5% significance level. And my alternate hypothesis is that the mean for the uh, shaded trees is smaller. So it's a one-tailed test. Okay, so it is one-tailed um, and it is 5%. Okay, so I need my diagram. So I'm only interested in one tail. Which tail is it? Well, it's going to be the tail where I've got low values because I'm interested in testing whether the mean for the shaded trees was smaller. Okay, so the sample mean was smaller. So that means that my z value, this was a negative value on the top, so I got a negative z value. So I'm interested in this tail down here is what this means. I need a 5% tail at this end of the distribution. Okay, now my uh, tables that I've got in my formula book Here's the top of the page in your formula book. And this diagram over here uh, in the top right-hand corner is helpful. We can see that we need a large probability um, uh, on the left side because it works with a positive Z. Now, our diagram's uh, the other way around. Our 5% tail, our 0 0.05 is on this end. 
Okay, but the tables want to work with a large probability, so I need to look at this 0 0.95, okay? So I'm going to be looking up 0 0.95 in the table, but I'm going to bear in mind my, tr my diagram's the other way around. So this has got to be a negative Z value, because Z is zero in the middle, okay? And the reason why I'm, I'm changing what's in the table is that my diagram is the opposite way around from the one assumed in the table. So on that same page, we now need to go down to the bottom of the page because the critical values need to work at the bottom. And we had a p-value of 0 0.95. So therefore, the z-value I need is going to be this 1.645. Here it is. Except because the, the diagram's the other way around, I need a critical value of minus 1.645. So now we're, on, we're ready to move on to our comparison. So I have a, a test statistic of minus 0 0.929. I have a critical value of minus 1.645, and I need to decide which is larger. Well, because these are both negative values, this one is actually greater than that one. But on the diagram, that means that the minus 0 0.929, okay, so this is um, minus 1.645, and minus 1.929 would be about there. OK, so I have to decide, is this significant or not? OK, you might be misled into thinking it's significant because it's greater. But actually, being greater means that we're in this big, unshaded, uninteresting bit. OK, it's only this tail of the distribution that is significant. So this is not significant um, at the 5% level. And therefore, because it's not significant, we make the decision we always do, which is to accept the null hypothesis. So we're going to be accepting H0. So I've done my comparison. And all I've got to do is now put that into context as a conclusion. So because I'm accepting H0, I'm saying I have no evidence. So I'm saying no evidence at the 5% level. No evidence that what? Well, I have to look back at my hypotheses. So my H1 was that the um, mean mass is smaller. Remember, it was a one-tail test. So I have to refer back to that. I have to say that there is no evidence at the 5% level that the mean mass is smaller for the apples that were grown in the shade. That's fully related back to the context. So I have my conclusion. I've got all the data there to back it up, and I'm done.